Let's talk about mechanical digestion and the movement of food through the digestive tract. If we start up at the top of the digestive tract, we have to start with the process of ingestion, which is taking the food in, and mastication or chewing of the food. And of course, this takes place in the mouth. Just so that you're aware of the importance of the mouth, I want to go quickly through some of the functions of the mouth because not only is it important as the site of ingestion and the location of mastication and salivation, the mouth is also important because it provides sensation. We detect um, temperature and taste and texture all through receptors in the mouth. So it's an important sensory organ in addition to being important for ingestion and mastication. Also, the mouth is important as part of the respiratory system. It's important for ventilation because we can breathe through the mouth, and it's important for speech as well. The larynx actually provides the sound, but it's the mouth with the teeth and the tongue and the lips that provides the shapes that shape the sound into words that we can recognize as speech. Other important structures for mastication include the tongue and the lips and the cheeks, which are important for holding the food in the mouth as well as moving the food around relative to the teeth so that we can chew it appropriately. The teeth themselves are also very important for mastication. We have teeth that are good for biting, different teeth that are good for tearing, other teeth that are good for crushing, and teeth that are good for grinding. We have these different types of teeth as a reflection of the different types of food that we have in our diet. If you look at the roof of the mouth, the palate is important because it provides a barrier between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity so that our food stays out of our nose while we're chewing. Also important for mastication, as well as swallowing and chemical digestion, is salivation. The saliva contains three main components that we're going to discuss. First is water. Most of the saliva is water. This water is important to moisten the food so that it's easier to chew, and it's also important for dissolving the molecules in the food. We need to dissolve the molecules in the food in water for two reasons. One, so that we can taste them, so that the dissolved molecules can actually work their way along the sides of the papillae or the bumps on the tongue and into the taste buds where we have receptors for taste, and also for the activity of the enzymes involved in chemical digestion. If food molecules are not dissolved in water, then the enzymes can't get a hold of them to break them apart for chemical digestion. In addition to water, saliva also contains mucus. This is why saliva forms strands instead of just drops like water. The mucus in the saliva is important because it provides lubrication for swallowing, but it also helps to bind the food together into a lump that we call a bolus. You can't swallow food if it's all dispersed through your mouth. We have to form it into a bolus, into a lubricated lump in order to swallow it, and the mucus helps to form that bolus. The third important component of the saliva are enzymes, and there are a lot of different enzymes in the saliva. They're important for chemical digestion, for breaking down the food, and we'll be looking at those in more detail when we get to the section on chemical digestion. The saliva is produced mainly by three large sets of glands. We have the parotid salivary glands that are here on the sides of the mandible, and the submandibular salivary glands that are under the mandible, and we have some sublingual salivary glands that are found under the tongue. If you've ever had something really sour to eat, if you put something really sour into your mouth, it triggers a strong reflex of salivation, and you may actually have felt a squeezing or a tingling in the locations where we find these salivary glands. Sometimes we salivate more than other times, which indicates that there's a mechanism for regulating the level of salivation, and in fact, there is. We have a salivary center in the medulla oblongata of the brain that regulates when we salivate and when we don't. Just like a lot of the other centers that we've seen in the brain, there are sympathetic neurons and parasympathetic neurons in the salivation center. The parasympathetic neurons are the ones that activate salivation. So things that activate the parasympathetic neurons are going to trigger salivation and release more saliva into your mouth. Some things that activate the parasympathetic neurons to cause more salivation would be something like the taste of food, like the sour object I talked about earlier. You put food in your mouth and the taste of the food sends signals to your brain that activates salivation. 
but we don't have to taste food in order to salivate. Um, the smell of food strongly triggers salivation as well. Something like uh, brownies baking in the oven or fresh baked bread. These have really stimulating aromas that send signals to our brain saying, ooh, we smell something really good, let's hope we eat it. Send signals through the salivary center down the parasympathetic neurons to cause you to salivate. Even the sight of food can do this. So just looking at a picture of food in the magazine or watching a cooking show on television can stimulate salivation. And even so much as the thought of food can stimulate salivation. So if you even think about something really good like a luscious chocolate cake, you can stimulate the release of saliva from your salivary glands. Now if the parasympathetic neurons are going to be stimulating salivation, sympathetic neurons inhibit salivation. When we activate sympathetic neurons in the salivary center, they go to the salivary glands and they reduce the amount of saliva being released. Think for just a minute about the sorts of things that activate sympathetic neurons or the sympathetic nervous system. We've talked a lot about two main things that are activating the sympathetic nervous system. One is activity or exercise and you'll notice that when you're active you aren't as likely to drool as you are when you're resting or sleeping. The other thing that triggers the sympathetic nervous system is strong emotions. Things like arousal or anger or fear. Think about the last time you had to do any public speaking and how did your mouth feel? Right, it's pretty dry. That's because the signals of fear or nervousness go through the sympathetic neurons and they turn off salivation in the mouth right when you wish you had some saliva so you could speak more clearly. And instead it's sending the body's resources to the muscles that are necessary for action. Once we've chewed up the food, we want to swallow it. And the process of swallowing is called deglutition. Deglutition is a complicated process. It involves the coordination of over 20 different muscles, some of them voluntary and a lot of them involuntary. So this requires careful coordination. And there are deglutition centers in the pons and in the medulla oblongata of the brain that help to coordinate those muscles so that we can swallow without choking on our food. The voluntary part of swallowing begins with the tongue. Your voluntary choice to swallow involves your tongue pushing the bolus of food that you've created through mastication to the back of your throat. It goes to the oropharynx. In the oropharynx, there are receptors that detect that bolus. When receptors in the oropharynx detect the bolus, two things happen. One, we trigger the involuntary steps involved in swallowing. And two, there's a signal that goes up to the respiratory center of the brain and inhibits breathing. Think for a minute about why it would be important to inhibit breathing when you're going to swallow. Right, it's not very fun to breathe in when you're trying to swallow because then you can aspirate the food into your lungs and it's a very unpleasant situation. So the oropharynx senses the bolus, keeps you from breathing, and triggers involuntary steps in swallowing. These include things like the uvula moving up. The uvula moves up to block the passage to the nasal cavity so when you swallow food doesn't get pushed up into your nose. The epiglottis folds down to cover the opening to the trachea so that no food goes into the airways. And then the only place left for the food to go would be into the esophagus. If you remember the structure of the esophagus, the esophagus is lined with stratified squamous epithelium. That's important for protection because we're sending lumps of food down the esophagus and we don't want it to be damaged by that friction. The esophagus produces a wave of smooth muscle contraction called peristalsis. And we're going to see a lot of peristalsis, the smooth muscle contraction that's happening in a wave. Not everything at once, but it moves along an organ. Peristalsis is important for being able to push the bolus of food down the esophagus and eventually into the stomach. One of the driving forces behind peristalsis is that the smooth muscle in the esophagus is sensitive to stretch. So when the bolus is pushed into the esophagus, that stretches the smooth muscle of the esophagus and the stretch causes the smooth muscle to contract. That pushes the bolus down a little further where it stretches a new area of the esophagus, which stimulates that area to contract, 
which shoves the bolus down a little further. And you can see from the animation that the bolus is pushed all the way down the esophagus in this way. At the bottom of the esophagus, the food encounters the lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter is between the esophagus and the stomach. And it's really important that the es lower esophageal sphincter remain closed most of the time. Why do you think that's important? Right, because most of us are well aware that stomach acid up in the esophagus is an uncomfortable situation. That's actually what causes heartburn or acid reflux is stomach contents, which have a very low pH, going up past the lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus. The esophagus is not designed to withstand that sort of low pH, and so it damages the esophageal cells and causes a lot of pain. So the lower esophageal sphincter is closed most of the time. It opens as a result of the pressure caused by peristalsis. Peristalsis pushes the food down against the lower esophageal sphincter and pushes until the food actually sort of pops through the sphincter and ends up in the stomach. 